So uh, it'll be provided this morning. I'll sit around and, and uh, get our morning going. And then by 8, we'll be working and we should finish up by 12. So please consider that. Thank you. Uh, also, have another a little announcement. If you walked into the main or through these uh, side doors here, you may have saw an addition uh, under the uh, pastor's mugshot walls. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Dana and uh, Martha and, and I and uh, probably some others have been working together on trying to get worship bags for uh, our uh, younger kids, for uh, those who are coming here to worship. And since we don't have right now a sort of a dedicated children's church hour, we thought a way to uh, keep people, keep the children in sanctuary and engaged and accessible in sanctuary uh, in worship. We uh, sort of come up with these little bags and uh, Dan has put in some activities in there and we've also included some bulletins and this is what I wanted to lift up um, on the little uh, pedestal, which I presume Gary made that. Yes, good, so we thank Gary for that. Um, there's a pedestal over there. You'll see these little bulletins. Um, I borrowed a lot of this content from uh, another Presbyterian church, but I thought they said some of the things so well. Um, and it's a way of welcoming children in worship. Uh, having children in this space is so important. So important not only for them right now, but important for the future of the church. If children get used to and acquainted to being in sanctuary, they're more likely to come back to worship, you know, during after those college years and stuff like that. So this is just a way of, of uh, for adults, either parents, grandparents, or if you don't have any kids, you know, this is just a way for you to engage uh, children in worship. So I encourage you to, to pick this up. It, I can always print more if you if you want to take one home. Uh, and then for for our kids, you'll see in the bags there'll be a couple other bulletins. These are more for the the older kids who want to follow along with worship and they can uh, take notes. I saw that again in another little, another church. So we're just trying to make worship more accessible, uh, more welcoming for our younger, uh, younger churchgoers. Uh, so again, I encourage you to uh, look at these, look through the bags if you're interested, or if you have any ideas, and certainly if you have any young people either in your family or your neighborhood or something, invite them and, and, and tell them that we, we certainly don't ignore our, our little kids. So we certainly want to thank you, thank all of them who are here, and uh, so lift them up. Did you want to add anything else? Ever been there? Uh, any other announcements you want to lift up this morning? Uh, seeing none, let us worship the Lord.
Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good. God has said that love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God said that love endures forever. Our hymn is number 504. Thank <laughs> you.
brothers, no one who takes refuge in God will be condemned. Believe the good news. The forgiveness is ours in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. 
Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ear toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Friends, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed Reverend Cave's sermon last week. He spoke very eloquently and very personally on God's providential care. If you missed that sermon, you can find it and other services on our church website. That was the end of the shameless advertisement. <laughs> In his sermon, Reverend Cave made a brief mention to one of many human responses to God. Now I'm thinking of the phrase, fear of God. We heard that phrase this morning, too, when the psalmist proclaims, Fear the Lord, you his saints. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Now, many Western Christians today don't like to talk about fearing God. Well, as you probably have guessed, I'm not a traditional Western Christian. <laughs> a fear of God is not only a biblical response, but also a healthy response. To God. And as you can tell by the title, today's sermon is about fear as reverence. Next Sunday, we'll talk about fear as apprehension. In struggling, struggling to understand the biblical meaning of fearing God is not something that is new or limited to our present circumstance. Martin Luther, too, struggled with finding the right understanding. So he came up with two distinctions of fear. He distinguished between what he called servile fear and filial fear. On the one hand, servile fear is the kind of fear that a prisoner in a torture chamber has toward his tormentor. It's a dreadful anxiety brought about by a very clear and a very present danger, and usually represented by another person. Servile fear refers to the posture of servitude toward a malevolent despot. Filial fear, on the other hand, which derives from the Latin concept of the family, refers to the fear children have toward their parents. In this regard, Luther is thinking of children who have a tremendous respect and love for father or mother. This love and respect manifests itself in a desire to please one's parents. It's an anxiety of offending one's parents, not out of fear of torture or punishment, but out of fear of displeasing father or mother the source of security and love. Now this filial fear is exactly the type of fear the Christian ought to have. We don't need to fear God as some pernicious oppressor. God isn't constantly turned against his children. 
Yes, God's judgments may be against a person or people, but God's love is never corrupted. God never hates his chosen people. In fact, because God does love us, and that love is steadfast and eternal, we, therefore, ought to be moved with contrition when we sin against God. When we sin, we disobey God, who is rightfully upset. That is what we should fear doing. We should fear upsetting God. Not because of any punishment we may receive, but out of respect for our Heavenly Father. Luther's filial fear is a fear of offending the graciousness and love of God. Now, the only way we know we have offended God's <coughs> love is by knowing God. This is why the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Calvin says this type of knowledge is more than a matter of simple knowledge. When I was younger, my family loved to go to buffets after church for birthdays or <coughs> One day when I was at our local Ryan's, I was so smitten by the variety of food that I overloaded my plate. <laughs> I had trouble eating all the things I picked out, and my mother was upset with me for wasting food. She told me that I fed my eyes rather than my stomach. And she was right. <laughs> My visual intake of food was so much greater than what my belly could actually hold, which means I couldn't enjoy everything on my plate. The wiser decision would have been to choose one or two entrees and, insa and savor every bite. <coughs> now, I think that is what the psalmist is getting at when he says we should taste and see God's goodness. We have to take the time to experience God and savor God's goodness and mercy in order to truly appreciate God's mercy and graciousness. Now that appreciation is the impetus to our fear of God. It has to be. <coughs> That explains why the psalmist so easily transitions from O oh, taste and see to O oh, fear the Lord. Blessed, says the psalmist, are they who take refuge in God. Blessed is she who finds her happiness in the Lord. Blessed is he who welcomes God into his heart. Blessed are they who fear and revere the Lord. Those who do fear the Lord lack for nothing. Now, I don't believe the psalmist is proclaiming a prosperity gospel here. He's not saying if you pray hard enough or give often enough or love deeply enough, then God will make you rich. No. He says, those who seek the Lord lack no good is life going to be a stroll down easy street? Absolutely not. Those who seek the Lord and fear the Lord know beyond any shadow of doubt that God's goodness and mercy are with them. There's no better news than knowing God's everlasting presence is with you. But the buck doesn't stop there. The psalmist calls his hearers to listen up, and he will teach them, teach us, the fear of the Lord. The psalmist is going to give us some practical advice on properly fearing God. Fear of the Lord as reverence or respect means to keep the tongue from evil 
and the lips from speaking deceit. Now the letter of James speaks so eloquently about the power of the tongue. He compares the tongue to the relatively small rudder of a large ship. At the will of a captain, a vessel will turn to and fro. The tongue, though it is a small member, boasts of great things. And James isn't praising the tongue here. He says that a massive forest fire can be set by the tiniest of flames. And the tongue, if unchecked and unbridled, is a fire of unrighteousness. He says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. This double tongue, as the apostle calls it, ought not to be in the mouth of Christians. We can't both praise God and speak deceit against our neighbor. There's no way around that. Either we love God or and our neighbors, or we hate God and despise our neighbors. Now, this is so important for us to understand. The fear of the Lord, our reverence of God, our reverence to God, also extends to our neighbors. Now, we don't praise our neighbors as we would praise God, but we should, as the psalmist says, turn away from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. Doing good is not for God's benefit. God is perfect goodness and doesn't need any more from us. Doing good and pursuing peace is for the benefit of others. It is on behalf of others. Calvin latches on to this when he comments, It is not the will of God that his servants should be idle but rather that they should aid one another, desiring each other's welfare and prosperity and promoting it as far as in them lies. Not only does Calvin impress upon us the need for right relationship with God, what we see here is also the importance of a rightly ordered relationship with our neighbor. Fear as reverence means we should not merely desire prosperity and welfare for others. It's easy to say, I hope things get better, or I'm praying for your situation. Fearing the Lord also means we should strive to promote that welfare and prosperity as much as humanly possible. The Christian must pursue peace. Calvin again says, not only ought we seek peace, but if at any time it shall seem to flee from us, God bids us use our every effort without ceasing in pursuing it. The pursuit of peace and the pursuit of happiness not for ourselves, but for others, is at the heart of our fearing God. <clears throat> Outwardly focused fear, when you respect, when your respect and reverence are directed toward the other, this will turn the world against you. Modernity focuses so much on the self, so much on the individual, my desires, my successes. The world calls for selfish, a selfishness that is narcissistic and egocentric. God calls for selflessness that is humble in the midst of persecution. This is why the psalmist includes in verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Fear as reverence incorporates humility and suffering. We come before God, 
our divine parent with a humble and contrite heart. We come before God knowing that we will face afflictions. The 21st century also doesn't like to talk about suffering. We try to remove pain and labor from our lives and make everything as easy as possible. This is not a biblical world view. Suffering and humility are part and parcel to reverential fear. Now, does this mean we ignore evil and deny victims justice under the law? By no means. Again, the Christian is called to pursue peace. This encompasses addressing evil and addressing malpractice. But we do so to God's design and for God's kingdom. And therein lies the access around all which all this revolves. Two weeks ago, I ended our Reformation sermon series with Soli Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we leave undone or unsaid must always be to God's glory. Our fear toward God is directed for his glory. Our respect and care for others is directed toward God's glory. Our spiritual lives, our private lives, our civic lives, our whole being is for God and to God. If ever there is misdirection away from God, then we should fear with apprehension. But I'll save that for next week. Until then, let us pray. God, our Father, we are your children. We know we disobey you in thought, word, and deed. We know we ignore your commands and seek after personal gain. Turn our hearts, O oh God, Guide our wills to align with you. Turn us to fear you in reverence and honor. We ask the Holy Spirit's guidance in giving all praise and glory to you. We ask for Christ's help in our imitation of him to be better stewards of our resources and better sisters and brothers to all our neighbors. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now in response to God's word, I invite you to stand with me and profess our faith with the words of the apostles. <coughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body and, and the life everlasting. Amen. Maybe <laughs> How can we withhold our gifts of gratitude in the face of such wondrous love? The glad and generous hearts, let us bring our offerings to God.
exalt you. For you are so good to us and gracious beyond measure. In this life you lead us, comfort us, guide us, and redeem us in countless ways. In death you usher us to even greater blessing, welcoming us to your table of goodness and plenty. These gifts we bring are but a token of our thanks, seeds to be planted for the growing of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now we will enter into a time of prayer for our loved ones, our family members, community, friends. Uh, during the today's prayer of the people, we're going to lift up the uh, saints who have passed away in the past two years. Uh, hopefully you were able to include some names for uh, All Saints Day today. Are there any others who wish to lift up at this time? Yes, Jean? Ryan Hedgehead. Ryan Hedgehead. Thank you. Yes. Todd Simmons and his family. Todd Simmons and his family. Thank you. Yes. Elena Davis and her family. Elena Davis and her family. Thank you. Jack? Um, we should keep uh, Leanne Head and her stepfather Tim in our prayers. He was admitted to the hospital, but uh, everything seems to be okay or at least treatable with medicine. So we just ask that you uh, keep them in, in your prayers as well. Any others? All right, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, author of our past and promise of our future. We lay before you our private fears and our concerns for the world, knowing that you hear our cries. Especially today, we pray for those whom Jesus called blessed, for the poor in spirit, for those who mourn, for the humble and meek, for those who thirst and hunger for righteousness, for the pure in heart, for those who show mercy and those who make peace. For those who are persecuted because of Christ. Pour out your blessings upon them and us, that we may be strengthened in every hardship and joyful at the recognition of every blessing. We call to mind before you all those who have died, those who taught us the faith, those who spoke your truth in the face of evil, those who cared for the weak and the suffering, and those whom we loved and cherished the most. Donna Ball, Betty Jo Bean, Carrie Berger, Abigail Cameron, Cecil Cardwell, Lorraine Davis, Kenny Gaddy, Ted Hogan Sr., Bill Horsley, Pat Horsley, Tom Howell, DJ Howell, Charles Judd, John Loranda, Walter Leggett, Ralph Legion, Ray Marshall, Joe Mason, Millie Midkiff, Percy Moore, Margaret Waleska Pegram Morrison, <coughs> Linda Orell, Christopher Parks, Stella May Pearson, Nancy Pitter, Janet Padraberic, Rob Quell, Tom Reef, Marsha Revis, Craig Riley, Opal Saunders, Marjorie Smith, Lois Smith, Wilda Smith. Jerry Saunders, Marie Stanley, Bob Steele, Al Stockdale, Edith Thomas, 
Bertha Vaughn. Thank you that their pain is ended and their joy made complete. God of the covenant, in baptism you claim us and show us how to live. Keep us in your care until that day when all creation sings your praise and you lead all your children to the springs of the water of life. Through Jesus Christ, our brother, our Redeemer, and our Lord. Amen. Amen. And I invite you to stand and sing hymn number 352, Great Are Your Mercies, O My Maker. Thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. 
It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, <clears throat> apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened the blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to those with ears to hear. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world, Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. According to Christ's commandment, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray, O God, that you will fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory. We shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Christ Jesus instructed us that when we pray, we do so as he taught us. Therefore, we boldly pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, 
Do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again in glory. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
God, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Now in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go out into this world, fearing the Lord, showing his love.